talked about uh, really redox reactions and again, how to balance them. And as we talked also about this morning, uh, again, a reminder, uh, a lot of times in sort of general chemistry, uh, we look at oxidation as, again, the loss of electrons, uh, reduction being that gaining of electrons. And we can really look at the oxidation number or oxidation state to help us understand, again, what is going on. Is somebody being oxidized? Is somebody being reduced? Uh, remember that they always occur uh, together. So if there's somebody being oxidized, there should be somebody being reduced and vice versa, somebody's being reduced. Uh, there should be somebody that's being oxidized. So it kind of makes it easy in a sense if you could identify at least one of the things happening. Uh, the other substance should be going through the opposite sort of event, if you will. Um, we talked about that again, you can use that number line to just basically figure out what is being oxidized, what is being reduced. So as you lose electrons, you have uh, more protons really, and you become more positive. So if you see that oxidation number move in a more positive direction, as it goes from the reactants to the product side, uh, then that substance is going through oxidation. Opposite is true when something gets reduced or gaining electrons. So they end up with more electrons really than protons. So they become more negative. So again, if you see that oxidation number move towards the negative side, uh, then that sub substance is being reduced. Basic, uh, just redox reactions, kind of neutral solutions, not too complicated ones. Uh, you basically just need to make sure that you have the same number of electrons on each side of the half reaction. Uh, so if this was our oxidation half reaction, and I know that because the electron should always be on the product side in that situation, and if I had a half reaction that electrons were on the reactant side, that would be my reduction half reaction. And remember that before you really could add these reactions back together, the electrons on both sides of the arrows uh, do need to be the same number of electrons. They should always completely cancel out. And in some cases, you may have to multiply one half reactant by a number, or you might even have to do both half reactants by a common number. Uh, but those electrons should always cancel out. When we are balancing a little bit more difficult sort of redox reactions in either acidic or basic solutions, uh, there's a few steps that we talked about that we want to do. Again, you want to split off basically into your half reactions. You want to uh, balance all elements except uh, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, just like normal. So you just use coefficients. You then want to balance the oxygen uh, by adding water to whichever side needs the oxygen. Remember that when you do add water, you're also adding hydrogen. So that means the opposite side should get two H pluses for every water that you basically add. At that point, you could add electrons to balance out the charge. In each half reaction. And again, by identifying what is the oxidation, what is the reduction, you could verify that you are adding the electrons to the correct side in each of those cases. You want to make sure, obviously, that they are the same number of electrons. Uh, then you can add the half reactions together. Obviously, with the same number of electrons. And once you do that, that would technically be a balance in acidic conditions. And, and uh, you should end up really with an H plus in your equation. And that H plus indicates that it is balanced in acidic conditions. And also important for if you wanted basic conditions, uh, we will add, thank you, OH minus to both sides. And that's equal to the number of H pluses that you have. Typically, when you do that, the side that has H plus and OH minus will make water as it has come together. You usually can reduce down the waters, and then you'll be left with a balanced and basic conditions, which should have OH minus in the actual equation. And again, you know that is balanced and basic. You're balancing in acidic or basic conditions. 
when it's all said and done, there should be basically two things that you have accomplished. You should have the same number of elements on each side of the arrow, like a normal balanced equation. And you should also have the exact same overall charge on each side of the arrow. Again, it does not have to be zero on both sides, but they do need to be the exact same total charge on both sides of the arrow. And then you know you have properly balanced the equation correctly. A reminder that if you should start out, for example, with something that has more hydrogens to start with in a HAP reaction, uh, you need to balance it uh, at some point with the hydrogens. So it's a good idea just to start with an H plus on the opposite side. That way, again, you kind of balance those hydrogens. So if you do come across a situation where you split off into the half reactions, you're kind of already starting with some extra hydrogen on one side versus the other. Uh, you could just simply add some H pluses to the opposite side and then continue on like normal and everything will balance and work out okay. Any questions on any of that balancing stuff? I think we talked about it last time. Okay, so we did a number of examples, I think, of the balancing. You might even have one more in your book that we skipped over that you want to do uh, for practice. But what we're going to now focus in on really is really the sort of the part of this chapter, which is sort of galvanic cells. And galvanic cells are really redox reactions. So they really are a oxidation and reduction reaction that is taking place. This is an example of a galvanic cell that you could build in the laboratory. And we don't use beakers too much anymore, but uh, uh, you can obviously use these. And basically there's several components to a galvanic cell. And the side over here in this picture is what is referred to as the anode side. And in the anode side, that is where oxidation occurs. So basically an oxidation reaction occurs on the anode side. And on the anode side, just like the cathode side, which is the other side, you typically have a solid electrode that's there. And whatever that solid electrode is, you typically will have that ion floating around in a solution, like you know some of those solutions we use today like uh, zinc sulfate, zinc nitrate, something like that, but a solution where that ion is floating around and that solid version of it uh, is uh, basically on the solid electrode. So what happens is as this process occurs and the oxidation reaction occurs, basically what's gonna happen is your solid zinc here is going to jump out into the liquid part and become an ion as it loses its electrons. So as it loses its electrons, it will jump from the solid state into basically the aqueous state there and go for a swim. It is those electrons which are important. Those electrons will travel across a wire from the oxidation part to the other side of our galvanic cell, uh, which is known as the cathode. And on the cathode side, that is where really the reduction reaction takes place. And you will also have a very similar setup here. Uh, you will have a solid electrode here. In this case, it's copper. And as you can see in here, we have some copper ions floating around in the solution. Or maybe you can't see so well up there, but there is some copper ions uh, floating around in that basic solution there. Uh, so what happens is as the electrons come in, they will actually hook up with those guy ions that are floating around. And that guy will then jump out of solution into the solid sort of form. Uh, so you got guys basically on the anode side where they're losing electrons. They go from the solid into the aqueous solution and go for a swim. Those electrons travel across the wire. They will also produce some voltage here as it goes through the voltmeter and <clears throat> we'll come to the other side where it will go through the reduction reaction and really combine with those ions that are floating around in the solution and those guys will kind of come out of solution into the solid form uh, you can kind of see it plate onto the solid electrode on the cathode side there is sort of a potential difference between the anode and the cathode, meaning kind of you could think of it, the cathode side a little bit more positive, which is going to help kind of draw those electrons to the other side of the cell and kind of keep it flowing. 
What really sort of keeps this reaction going or this galvanic cell going is the salt bridge. And the salt bridge is really important to keep this sort of reaction continuing without it kind of stopping. And the salt bridge is pretty much what it sounds like. It has some type of salt in it, some type of ionic compound that's in there. So in this example here, they have potassium chloride as the salt that's in that bridge. And what happens is the negative chloride comes down into the anode compartment. In this example, the positive potassium comes down into the cathode example. And by the way, that connects both of the uh, beakers in this case. You usually put a little bit of cotton on the bottom so the liquid won't fall out, but it's still able to kind of uh, kind of go through the cotton at the end and go into the beakers on both sides. This is really important to keep everything flowing and keeping the galvanic cell working. As we will talk about, basically those electrons can actually go out and do some type of work. It's pretty similar to when you put a battery into your battery compartment. Yes, there's a wire. You put the battery in, it does a redox reaction. The electrons go out and empower your device. Also, why we'll talk about if you put it in backwards, right? It doesn't work so well. Same thing with the galvanic cell, depending on what's the cathode and the anode that's going on. So why is the salt bridge important? Well, here's what would sort of happen if we kind of pulled the salt bridge away. If we took the salt bridge out of this galvanic cell and we kind of pulled it out, what's going to happen is, as we can see on the anode side, as this guy continues to go through an oxidation reaction, we're getting all these guys basically jumping into solution here and they're gonna make these positive zinc guys. So what you're doing in this case is building up a lot of positive charge over there in that side of the beaker. On the other side, as we can see, what's happening is those electrons are coming in and they're removing that positive charge from that side of the beaker, which is gonna leave all that sulfate in this particular case, a negative ion that's there to actually start to build up. So, if you pull the salt bridge out, what you're going to eventually get is a really big buildup of positive charge on the anode beaker and a big buildup of negative charge on the cathode beaker, which is not really good because electrons are what type of charge? They are negative, which means opposites attract. So if you end up doing this and you build up all that positive charge on the anode side, those electrons are not going to go anywhere. And they're definitely not going to go to the other side where it's building up negative charge, right? Because that's the same charge. They're not going to want to go that way. So that's really the function of the salt bridge because if we look at, we put our salt bridge back in, we now have this chloride that's coming in to really balance out those positive charges that are going to build up. If it wasn't there, we have something that's positively charged potassium coming in to really take care of all that buildup of negative charge that would happen if the salt bridge wasn't there. And that keeps really the right sort of balance in this particular galvanic cell to allow those electrons to continue to run to the other side without building up really the wrong positive charge in the wrong location. To start with, you kind of have a little bit more of a positive charge on that cathode side, which helps bring those electrons to that side. And again, that salt bridge helps keep that critical sort of balance that the electrons want to kind of run away from the anode side to the cathode side. Uh, again, without it going, I just rather stay here at the anode side is nice and positive on this side and those electrons won't go there. So that's really the function of salt bridge. And what would we see if we pulled the salt bridge? The voltage would actually go down, right? That's what you would expect to happen because you're no longer getting the electrons to go to the other side. So Although it may not seem really important to the salt bridge, it is a very important part of keeping the cell basically functioning. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. So if we look at what's really going on here, we see our uh, two half reactions. We basically have on the anode side our solid zinc uh, going and losing a couple of electrons here. Plus our two electrons. On the cathode side, those two electrons are going to come in and combine with our copper ion that's floating around in the solution and making our solid copper on that side. Again, we have the two electrons that have been transferred 
from the anode to the cathode. And if we obviously uh, put these guys together and add these two half reactions, we get the overall reaction of our zinc plus our copper two going to our zinc with a two plus charge and our copper with no charge. And again, this is zero to plus two. So again, if we follow our number line, we could really simply see that zinc starting at zero, ending at plus two, becoming more positive. Here, the copper is going to start at plus two and at zero. So copper starting at plus two, ending at zero, becoming more negative and heading in that direction, going through reduction in this case. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about galvanic cells and some uh, ways that they are sometimes represented. Uh, we sometimes talk about the potential difference between the anode and the cathode, and there is our galvanic cell built up. It's hard to see, but there is actually a cell bridge right about there uh, that is connecting those two beakers together. These are our solid electrodes, as you can see there and there and we get some voltage that is coming out in our screen. So the cell voltage, a volt is a joule work per coulomb of tr charge transferred. A coulomb is a unit of electrical charge. So one volt is one joule over a coulomb. Uh, it's also sometimes referred to as the electromotive force, EMF, or sometimes the cell potential. So in problems, you'll be asked perhaps one of those three things, solve for the cell voltage, solve for the EMF, or solve for the cell potential, they're pretty much all asking you to solve for the voltage of the cell is pretty much what they're asking you to do so. Again, that sort of potential difference, charge sort of difference on the cathode side versus the anode side is what's going to allow those electrons really to kind of pull to the other side. Looking at our overall reaction, a sort of shorthand that's oftentimes used with galvanic cells is this. This is what's sometimes referred to as the cell diagram. And the cell diagram is basically a, a shorthand of what the galvanic cell looks like. It is usually always written in this form. Anode comes first, followed by cathode. And basically, this is your anode compartment. And this is pretty much how it works. This is a reactant. This guy is a product separated by one line. This it represents the salt bridge, the two lines. And then we come to our cathode compartment where this is our reactant and this is our product. So again, you could the reactant and then product. And then to our cell diagram, reactant, and then product. So if you needed to go from the cell diagram to the equation, that is pretty much how it is written. You will also sometimes see some other things written in the uh, cell diagram. Uh, these are the concentration of our solutions in the beaker. And remember that there's a couple of things, as we talked about with thermodynamics, in terms of standard conditions, right? So... 25 degrees Celsius, one molar, if we're talking about concentration, one atmosphere, if we're talking about pressure. Uh, so you'll sometimes see the concentrations written in the cell diagram. Now, as we will see very shortly here, sometimes the electrode is actually a gas. Uh, and in a case of that, they will use something to represent sort of the solid electrode. Uh, maybe something like platinum they'll use, uh, maybe even use graphite or carbon. Uh, if it is just a electrode where you don't really have a solid version of it. So just to have sort of a solid version of it. And if it is a gas, you may see something like one atmosphere written there as the pressure. You may see also something like platinum in there, which really isn't part of the reaction. It's just being used as sort of the physical electrode. Uh, but those other things may sort of pop up into these cell diagrams. Any questions on that there? So let's talk about a really important thing, which is the standard reduction potential. And standard reduction potential is sometimes abbreviated as an SRP. And much like the name implies, it is a standard reduction potential. That means that we will see reactions that are all written as reduction half reactions. 
So these are, as we will see, like a table that you can look up. And they are all written as reduction reactions, which means they all will have something plus electrons going to the other side. They will also have an SRP value sort of given to you. As we will shortly talk about, you know, it is a reduction and an oxidation reaction occurring, which means when you go to this table, one of the reactions are actually in the wrong position. One of them is actually a reduction reaction when it should be an oxidation reaction. So if we hook this up, this is zinc here as our anode. Uh, we have hydrogen electrode as our cathode in this particular case. And here, because hydrogen is our cathode, there is no kind of solid version of hydrogen. Uh, so here they're using platinum as sort of a physical representation of the electrode. And we see incorporated into our equation the pressure because hydrogen is a gas. And we also see the platinum incorporated into our cell diagram, although it's not really part of the reaction. So we know that this is our anode compartment. This is our cathode compartment. And if we needed the overall reaction, this would be a reactant, this would be a product. So we come down here, that's a reactant, that's a product. Here, this would be a reactant, this would be a product. We come down, reactant and product. So again, that is how we get to our overall reaction from the cell diagram. But what we see here is what we uh, kind of saw before. Our zinc is going from, I'll write it below, zero in terms of oxidation state to plus two. Uh, which means it is losing electrons, becoming more positive, and go through oxidation. It is the hydrogen here that is starting at plus one and ending at zero in terms of its oxidation number. Again, if you look at the number line there, hydrogen starting at plus one and again ending at zero, heading in that direction, becoming more negative, which means it's going through reduction. Adding these back together gives us our overall reaction, uh, which again shows that basically our zinc going to our zinc with a two plus and our hydrogen going from plus one to zero. Now, when we look at these reactions or standard reduction potentials in chemistry, they needed a way, or a lot of times in chemistry, when they don't really have a way to maybe directly measure something, they oftentimes will pick something to use as a standard to figure out what the values of everybody is. And for SRP values, they basically chose <clears throat> the hydrogen electrode. And it's sometimes referred to as the standard hydrogen electrode or the SHE uh, for standard hydrogen electrode. And they basically gave it a value of zero volts. So this arbitrarily assigned the hydrogen electrode a value of zero volts. And this would be our standard reduction potential reaction here electrons on the reactant side to our hydrogen making H2 as an SRP value basically of zero. So basically what they did is they took this hydrogen electrode and pretty much hooked it up with all other elements and using the idea that they assign the hydrogen electrode a value of zero volts, hook it up to a voltage meter and they were able to basically figure out the SRP values for all the other elements. So they use this guy basically as a standard to do that. And again here, because it's hydrogen, we have that platinum electrode being used as sort of the solid electrode and obviously our hydrogen gas coming in and our H plus here in our solution supplied by the HCl which is basically the hydrogen ion that's floating around in that solution. So if we did hook up this uh, hydrogen electrode or standard hydrogen electrode with our zinc, and in this case, our zinc being, again, our anode in this case, and our hydrogen electrode being our cathode, they get a cell voltage when they hook these guys together of 0.76 volts. Now, using an equation, to calculate the cell voltage, one way that we could do it is to take E of the cathode minus E of the anode. And I'm gonna explain this to you right now, and it may not make perfect sense right at this moment, but hopefully as we do some more examples coming up, it'll make a little bit more sense. But if you are to use this equation, you typically would go to a table of SRP values and you would look up the two values, one for the anode and one for the cathode. 
and you basically would just put it into this equation the way you find it in terms of the sign. And that is because we are subtracting here. And the subtraction part actually changes the sign for you. And the reason you have to change the sign is one of them would technically be an oxidation reaction and one of them would technically be a reduction reaction that's taking place. So when they used this equation, they were able to figure out the SRP value for zinc in this case is minus 0.76 volts. And they basically put it into this equation with our cathode value being zero for our hydrogen electrode, and they're able to figure it out. So let's just look at this equation, this SRP value equation here that you would find in a table. And this would be the reaction that you would see, and the SRP value here uh, would be, in this case, negative 0 0.76 volts. So in this particular reaction, we're all good because zinc here, uh, <clears throat> actually zinc is the anode technically in this case. And it is not really the cathode, which is where reduction takes place. So this reaction is a reduction reaction, but really what is happening in this particular case uh, where zinc is actually being oxidized is the opposite reaction. It is actually zinc going to zinc with a two plus plus two electrons. And when you reverse a half reaction, this is actually the oxidation half reaction. What happens is the sign changes. So this would be plus 0.76 volts. <laughs> and when you sort of give a value for a half reaction, it should be really specific for how it's written. So let me demonstrate using just these two simple sort of numbers here, the difference between using this equation the way we find it and using it where you might want to add these values together. All right, so let's talk about doing it first off just the correct way, if you will. I won't say the correct way, but doing it where we actually are going to write the reactions correctly. So if we were to go to the table, the SRP table, this is what we would find. And we would know that looking at our cell, that the zinc is actually the anode, which means we actually need this reaction here. So we would take that reaction, from the table and we would reverse it and it would give us this reaction here. And again, because we reversed the reaction, we would change the sign that we would find in the table. Now the hydrogen half reaction, it is all good. And that is again, the one that we saw on the previous page here. This guy right here, our two electrons plus our H plus, so our two electrons plus our two H plus goes to our H2 in this case. And that has a value of zero volts. So now really in this sort of galvanic cell, we have everything written correctly here. If we add these reactions together, the electrons are gonna cancel and we're going to get our zinc plus our two H pluses going to our zinc with a two plus and H2. What I did in this particular case, is I actually changed the sign for the anode reaction, the oxidation reaction that I would find in the table. And because I changed the sign, if I wanted the E of the cell here, I would actually just add these together just the way I find them. And that would give me positive 0 0.76 volts, which is what they have in that particular cell. Now, if the only thing you were interested in was to calculate the E of the cell and you're really maybe not interested in balancing the equation, you just wanna know what the cell voltage would be basically. You could go to the table and you could find the hydrogen value and you could find the zinc value, which would be that value right there, the negative 0.76. And you could take E of the cell is E of the cathode minus E of the anode. And in this case, we would take our cathode, which is zero volts, 
we would minus it from the value that we would find in the table, which is negative 0 0.76 volts. You do not change the sign that you find in the table if you subtract. And the reason you don't do that is by subtracting, it will change the sign for you. It will always change the sign for the anode for you. And here you would get the same positive 0.76 volts. So again, it may not make a lot of sense right at this point, but if you go to the SRP value table and you want to not have to worry about changing signs of the anode, which is always the one that you would have to change from that table because it's always technically backwards, um, you can simply subtract the two values, leave the sign that you find alone in the table and subtract it because the subtraction is going to change the sign for you. If you want to change the sign yourself for the anode, you should then add the values together. You shouldn't like change the sign and subtract, otherwise you're putting it back. So you want to choose one. And I would highly recommend that you choose one perhaps and stick with it, either subtract or add and know that you have to change the sign yourself. Um, but I probably want to bounce back and forth too much. Otherwise, you're going to probably change the sign and add or not change the sign and subtract or something like that and kind of mess up. So you could add or you could subtract. But if you subtract, uh, it actually will change the sign for you. So you don't have to worry about it. If you decide to add, you do need to change the sign of the anode one or the oxidation half reaction yourself. Any sort of questions on that? And we're obviously going to do some examples in just a second here. But... Okay. So I say that because I roll personally a lot of times with the subtraction one, uh, but a lot of books and stuff will use the, the sort of adding one, assuming that you change the sign yourself. All right, so if we then hooked up our standard hydrogen electrode to say copper in this case, and do the same thing, we can figure out that the SRP value for copper is 0.34 volts. In this case, though, the hydrogen electrode is our anode. And here the copper is actually our cathode. So this also demonstrates a really important point. Pretty much anything can be the anode or cathode. It may or may not work very well, depending on what you put it together. Uh, but anything potentially could be either one, the anode or the cathode. They don't always have to be the cathode or the anode. Uh, they could be on either side. As we'll talk about, positive voltage is usually really good for your cell. And if you get negative voltage, all you need to do is what? Just switch them, right? Make your anode, your cathode, your cathode, your anode. It will flip everybody around and you'll get positive voltage. Again, very similar to putting the battery in backwards. It doesn't work, right? Then you flip it around. Now it will actually work and become spontaneous and it will sort of work in that situation. Uh, so here again, this is uh, our hydrogen in this case going from zero to plus one, becoming more positive and being oxidized. Here is our copper going from plus two to zero, becoming more negative and being reduced in this particular case. So this is an SRP valued sort of table. And as you can see, they are all written as reduction reactions. So as I was mentioning before, you will have to, in certain cases, flip a reaction, technically speaking, to make it into the oxidation reaction. And when you do, you do flip the sign. And here's another table. Here's another table, which you clearly can see all those are numbers, probably not. But you also have, obviously, a table in your book of all these values, SRP values. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that's important when we use these sort of values. Uh, the E not for the cell is uh, basically written uh, for the reaction exactly how it is. Uh, so once again, if we took our zinc plus our two electrons gave us our zinc here and it was the E of the cell was a negative, I think 0.76 volts. This is what is referred to as an SRP value, standard reduction potential. Again, if we did flip it around the other way, the zinc going to our zinc with the two plus and our two electrons, we would flip the sign. This is sometimes referred to as an SOP, standard oxidation potential is what is sometimes referred to if you flip it around because it's an oxidation reaction. Now, how do you know if you go to a table and by the way, before we talk about that, if we do write a half reaction, either the oxidation half reaction or the reduction half reaction, and you need to give the 
sort of E value for those, you should do it with the correct sign. So if you are writing the equation, so if you were to write this equation and ask what is the E value, this should be, if you wrote all the numbers there, should be the correct sort of sign that you should use for it. If you're asked to write the reduction one, this is the correct value that should go with that reaction. So if you are asked to write the actual half reaction and give the sort of SRP value for it, you should give it with the correct sign um, as it is basically based on the equation. <clears throat> So if we are building a galvanic cell and we want to know perhaps which one should be our anode, which one should be our cathode, and there's really nothing else given to you in that sort of problem or situation, like you're not told the overall reaction that's happening, uh, you're not given anything in words to tell you how the reaction is taking place, you're just simply told, hey, you're going to build a galvanic cell out of these two things. You might want to have an idea as to which one you might want to put on your anode side or your cathode side. So we could use the more positive E value, the greater the tendency for that substance to be reduced. So if you go to this SRP table and you look at the two things you're going to build your galvanic cell out of, the one that has a more positive E value should be reduced. And if it should be reduced, it should be your anode or cathode. That should be your cathode. So in a situation where you're, again, not given the reaction that's going on or anything like how it's going to react, and it's just a simple build a galvanic cell out of these two things, the one that has the more positive E value from the table should be your cathode. And by default, the other guy obviously should be your anode. So that is how you could determine which one is which. The half cell reactions are reversible as we talked about. And again, if you do reverse it, you should change the sign on the SRP value table. And again, um, if you do that, then if you change the sign, add the values together for E of the cell. And again, if you don't change the sign, subtract them. The last thing that sometimes will happen is again, because we have two half reactions, we may need to multiply by a common number to get the electrons to be the same in each of the half reactions. And unlike a lot of things like thermodynamics and stuff like that, when we multiply a, an equation by a common number, we multiply, say, the delta H, delta S, delta G value by that number. Uh, here, we don't do that. So if you need to multiply a half reaction by a common number to get the same number of electrons, it will have no effect on the value that you see in the table. It will still be the same value. So you don't need to multiply the E value by that number, but you may need to multiply, obviously, the equation by that to get the electrons to cancel. So those are a few important things. If you reverse the reaction, change the sign. If you uh, multiply by a common number, don't change the value of the E. And lastly, the one that is more positive should be your cathode. And um, the other one should be your anode. No other information is given to you. Any questions on that there? Now, obviously, in book problems, you may have to refer to the SRP table to find some of the values and stuff like that. So let's take a look at one here. So why don't we do a couple of things? Why don't we actually write the balanced equation? And let's also figure out what is our cathode and which one is our anode. And let's calculate E of the cell here. So give it a go, see what you come up with. These would be the values that you would find in an SRP table. Okay, let's take a look. So again, here, we're looking for our E of the cell. We're going to build this galvanic cell basically out of cadmium and chromium. Uh, we would go to our SRP table there and find our values. Again, you could use uh, E of the cell is equal to uh, e of the cathode minus E of the anode. And this would be a case where we would not change the sign of the values that we find there. The other option there, again, is like I said, you could choose to actually add them together and change the sign yourself. So again, it's really up to you whichever way you want to do it. I'm going to demonstrate both here in this problem so you can see, again, what your options are. But the first thing we want to do, regardless really of, of which one we're going to choose, uh, we want to figure out maybe what is our anode and what is our cathode. So in this particular case, we were not given really any information about how the reaction is going, which clearly if we are given an equation or something that tells us this is the reaction we're looking at, we should actually look at the equation and see what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. But in this case, we're not. So we want to look at the one that is more positive in this case. 
and that would be this guy is more positive. And even though they're both negative, that is more positive. And that would be our cathode in this case. This would then be our anode by default. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so since I want to actually write the overall balanced equation in this case, I am going to actually reverse my reaction here. And I am going to reverse my anode reaction because right now it's written as a reduction reaction. Electrons are on the incorrect side. So to do that, I'm going to flip it around and have my chromium going to my chromium with a plus three charge and my three electrons. Now it is a oxidation reaction, electrons on the correct side. Because I did that, my E value should now become not negative 0.74, but positive 0.74 volts as I reverse that reaction. Any questions on that there? So for the time being, I'm going to uh, just kind of put a line through this guy here since we kind of flipped it around underneath. I am now ready to add these half reactions together, but I am running into another problem. In the first half reaction, I have two electrons. In the last one there, I have three. So I obviously cannot add them together until they have the same number of electrons. So in this case, we actually need to multiply each half reaction by a common number uh, to get it to six, which would work. So this top one here needs to be multiplied by three. Bottom one that I've already flipped here would need to be multiplied by two. And I'm going to just uh, kind of rewrite it underneath the dotted line here. And rewriting the top one, that's going to give me three of the cadmium two pluses plus six electrons gives me two of the cadmium, I'm sorry, three of the cadmium there with the solid. And my E value for this guy will still remain the same because I didn't reverse it. And again, it is unaffected by multiplying by a number. So we don't need to multiply the E value by a number. We just leave it alone, just like we find in the table. Doing our bottom one, multiplying by two, <laughs> excuse me, gives me uh, two of the chromium goes to two of the chromium with a plus three charge and going to give me six electrons. Here, I already flipped the sign, so it's going to stay positive 0.74 volts in this case. Once again, the multiplying by two will not have an effect on the E value. Now I'm good to go to add these together. And if I did it correctly, my electrons should completely cancel like normal, and they do. That gives me the balanced equation of what's going on. Everybody on the left stays on the left of the arrow. Everybody on the right stays on the right. I guess if I write it correctly, it would be helpful, I suppose. All right, that's CD plus two of the CR3 plus. First off, any questions on how to get to the overall reaction? All right, that's balanced. Okay, yeah. For the chromium one, I already did. It was originally from the table a negative. So I already changed it when I originally flipped it over. Yeah. yeah. If you looked up chromium in the table, it was still, it would be in the negative value. So when I flipped the original, I changed it at that point. But you do have to do it, yeah. Other questions? Okay, now I can get to the E of the cell part. And again, I have my two options as to how you might want to do it. In this particular problem, the way I made this problem, uh, we ended up having to add up the equation. Yeah, question. You do not by the common number. So that's something that's very different than, say, what we did with thermodynamics when you would multiply it. Uh, here, it's unaffected by that. So you can multiply by any common number you want. Uh, the SRP value will still remain the same. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, so at this point, because we sort of added together and I reversed that reaction and I gave the correct E value for the way the oxidation reaction is written, if I want to calculate E of the cell at this point, I can simply add these guys together because I have already changed the sign. And if I do that in this case, this will give me E of the cell as minus 0.40 plus uh, 0.74 gives us 
zero point three four volts as our cell voltage. So if I change the sign myself, which is what I did here, because again, originally it was negative here, I want to add and use this equation here, which is what I did. Now, if you simply just really wanted, or even if you did this, if you just simply wanted E of the cell, you could use this equation and not have to worry about changing signs. So if we went to the table, and I'm just going to erase some of this here so we can see our value. I kind of put a line through it. So if we went to the SRP table that's in our book, we would find basically this value here for the cadmium. We would find this value here for the chromium in their negative and negative for both of them. And if you choose to do the subtraction version, you should leave the sign alone, which means that we would take our cathode, which was minus 0 0.4 volts, minus my number there for my anode, minus 0.74 volts. That is why we are subtracting here. Those two are now going to turn it into a positive for you and you will end up with the same value here. So if you want to subtract, you should not change the value that you find in the table because that's the purpose of subtracting because it will change it for you. Uh, but if you do want to change the sign yourself, then change the sign and add. So again, I would choose one way or the other and kind of stick with it. Maybe the subtraction is a little easier because you don't have to remember to change the sign yourself because it will just do it for you. So maybe that is the better one maybe to kind of remember, take the cathode minus the anode and just by taking the values, just as you find them on the table, you could put them in there and it will just, the equation will change the sign for you correctly. Maybe that is the better way, but if you want to change it yourself, you could add them together. Any questions on the difference in the two sort of approaches there? So basically subtract, keep the sign, add, change the sign. So that's basically the difference. Okay. So let's take a look at another one here. Galvanic cell made of magnesium and silver. These again are the values that you would find in your table. What is the standard EMF of the cell, which is a I guess fancy way of saying what is the cell voltage basically here? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so we're really calculating E of the cells. So here in this case, those would be the values you would find in the table. So if you want to go with the subtraction version, uh, that's pretty much all you need is to find those two values. And secondly, to determine which one's your anode and cathode. In this case, again, we're not given any information on how this reaction is taking place. So we can use our SRP values here to determine. In this case, it does look like the silver is going to be more positive. So that should be our cathode. And by default, obviously here, the magnesium would be our anode. And if we are not going to uh, kind of worry about anything else other than subtracting, we would take our 0 0.80 volts minus, again, we're not going to change the sign here because I'm subtracting, our minus uh, 2.37 going to give us a voltage of 3.17 volts. Now, again, uh, if you were to change the sign, here, we would need to multiply the silver by two to get the same number of electrons. Again, that will have no effect on its E value of 0 0.8 volts. This technically would be the one we would need to reverse, which means we would end up with magnesium uh, going to magnesium two plus and two electrons because we reversed it the sign here would go from negative to positive 2.37 volts. And if we wanted the overall reaction, our electrons here would cancel, giving us two silver plus magnesium, going to two silver plus magnesium with a plus two. Here, if I did that this way, your other option again is at this point, you would add those together because you already changed the sign yourself to give you the same voltage. So again, it is sort of a preference as to which way you want to kind of go with it. Any questions on that one? Obviously, we weren't asked here to balance the equation, so you didn't need to actually do it in this particular problem. So you could see as well, this might be a quicker version to get to the answer, uh, but each way would work, yeah. Yeah. 
In this particular idea of reaction, you have to do it to both half reactions. You don't, um, and you just need to make sure you have the same number of electrons in each. So in this case, the uh, magnesium had two to start with, and the silver only had one. So to get them both to the same number, we actually just need to multiply by the, the silver one by that number. Do the multiply. Yeah, you, you don't have to. So just in general, for any redox reaction, when you have the two half reactions, uh, you may have to multiply only one of them by a number to get it to the same number. Or in some cases, you may have to multiply both of them by a number. You don't have to necessarily do both. Yeah. The goal there is just to make sure that you end up with the same number of electrons in each. Yeah. Yeah, because the table is an SRP table, which stands for standard reduction potential, which means every single reaction that you see in that table, they're all reduction reactions, which means technically speaking, one of the values that you look up in that table is incorrect in terms of how it's written, because it should be the oxidation reaction, should be the reverse reaction, which is why you technically should have to reverse one of them. And again, if you wanted to do that to change the sign, you would change the sign of one of them and then add them. But if you don't want to, again, worry about sort of changing the sign or doing that, you could just take the value as you find it from the table, and that subtraction equation will change it for you. You do, because that's the oxidation one, right? And the cathode is always the reduction one, which means when you go to that standard reduction potential table, they're perfectly written as reduction reactions, so they're good to go. Other questions? All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, cell potential work and some free energy. Free energy, right, is our delta G. And really, uh, delta G is the free energy available to do some type of work. And that's the idea behind sort of uh, these galvanic cells and the electrons kind of going out. Those electrons, as they travel through the wire, kind of like your battery in your battery compartment, the electrons traveling through the wire, they go out and do some type of work, like power your device and stuff like that. So a joule of work produced when one coulomb of charge is transferred from two points uh, by a circuit only differs by the potential of one voltage. And really the maximum work that you could do is equal to our delta G. And delta G is important as we talked about before because you could use delta G to determine whether or not a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So a reminder that when you do have a negative delta G, the reaction is going to be spontaneous, which means it should occur. And obviously, if you have a delta G that is positive, it's going to be non-spontaneous, uh, which means that that reaction will not occur. So there is a relationship between really delta G and E of the cell uh, that allows you to make a prediction as to whether or not this reaction uh, will sort of occur, be spontaneous. And uh, that relationship there is this one here. Delta G is equal to, <coughs> excuse me. Talk about all this here in a sec. There we go. So delta G naught is equal to minus NF delta E of the cell. And these are a couple of things. Uh, delta G is our free energy or gives free energy like we talked about in the thermodynamics chapter. N is the moles of electrons that are being transferred. F is Faraday's constant, 96,500 joules per volt per mole, or 96,484, if you want to use the real number there. Um, and E of our cell is our one that we've been doing here, basically our cathode minus our anode. So that is from the table, and then we calculate it. So what does this reaction so, or this formula tell us? If we just look at this equation, delta G equals minus NFE. N and F are going to be positive values no matter what, which means when we hit a positive cell voltage, that positive and this negative will always turn our delta G into a negative value. So that is why when we get a positive voltage, it's a good thing because it's a spontaneous reaction and it should occur. If we end up with a cell voltage that is actually negative, that negative and this negative will turn our delta G into a positive value, which means that the reaction will be non-spontaneous the way it's written. 
And that's why negative voltage is not so great in a galvanic cell. It means it pretty much will not occur. Again, kind of similar to putting your battery in backwards. It won't work. It's going to be non-spontaneous, but if you flip it around, you know, it will be spontaneous there. Also really important is the value that you use for N here, which is the number of moles. And that really is the balanced number of moles that have been transferred. So for example, just to uh, look at the one we just looked at where we have the two half reactions, I think. We'll come back to this here. So when we looked at these half reactions in this particular one here, and we wanted to determine what the value of N would be in this case. The value of N would actually be two. It would not be four. So we don't want to add those together, but it's basically the balanced number of electrons that have left the anode side of the reaction and ended up at the cathode side. So in this case, the value would be two. A common mistake people make is they kind of add those together and use four. So again, it's just the total number of electrons that basically has left the oxidation reaction and ended up at the cathode reaction. So it's important thing to keep in mind. Now uh, we could also pull into here our good friend K, which you know we haven't seen in a bit here. So that is our equilibrium constant. And E of the cell is equal to RT NF natural log of K. Uh, so R is our gas constant, and it is the one that involves energy, that 8.314 version. T is our temperature in Kelvin, and is still our moles, and F is obviously our Faraday's constant. So this ties our E of the cell to our K value. And as we will see, it pretty much works the same way if we have a large value of K, we should probably have a positive value of E and vice versa. If you happen to be at 25 degrees Celsius, these guys here will kind of become constants and it will reduce down to two other versions of this equation, which is E of the cell is equal to 0 0.0257 volts divided by N, natural log of K, or if you like the base log 10 and 0.0592, uh, divided by n times the log of k. You absolutely don't have to worry about these two equations if you just worry about this equation. You could just plug the numbers into that equation. It'll come out the same. I will say that depending if you choose any of those three equations on the bottom and how you round, especially if you're solving for something like k, you may get a slightly different answer depending where you la uh, round, depending if you do kind of the inverse of the natural log or the inverse of the log and the rounding does make a little bit of a difference. But the exponent part of the number that you probably will get uh, will still be pretty close to each other. So this ties our E of our cell through our thermodynamics here. If you know E of the cell, you could get delta G through this equation we just talked about. You could also get K through this equation here. And obviously if you have K and G, you could use the one that we saw in thermodynamics to go between those. Our, triangle of death here between these things here all right <clears throat> so out of this equations here definitely should know this guy and that guy would be definitely helpful clearly uh if you have something to do with delta g then to use the top one it has to do with e of the cell and obviously anything involving an equilibrium constant bottom one there is obviously the one that you should choose so as we were talking about a second ago really if you still understand hopefully what the value of K represents, you can pretty much figure out how everybody else should sort of end up. Obviously, as we just talked about, if you have a large value of K, that means you should have some positive cell voltage and a negative delta G. They all should agree with each other because a negative delta G means reaction is spontaneous, which means you should be making some products. If you're making some products, you should have a larger value of K. So all that should agree. And vice versa, obviously, if you have a small value of K, you have a negative cell voltage, which means that reaction is not going to be spontaneous. And if it's not spontaneous, it means it's pretty much sitting on the reactant side, which means you have a lot more reactants than products, which is what gives you that small value of K. So again, all should sort of agree if you do some of these calculations. So let's do some of these calculations here. Calculate the delta G and is this reaction spontaneous based on this equation and the SRP values going on here. 
Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, so obviously we're doing some delta G and we got some SRP values given to us. So this is the equation we should look for. Uh, we are looking for this guy. Uh, we can find this guy once again by doing our E of the cathode minus E of the anode. So we'll come down here and we are given an equation here. So this guy's going from plus two, this is zero, this is zero, this is plus two. So if we look at the copper, it's going from plus two to zero, it is actually becoming more negative, uh, which means this is being reduced. So this would be our cathode. And if we look at the iron, it's going from zero to plus two, becoming more positive, which means it's going through oxidation and the iron here would be our anode. You should look at the equation if it is given to you and not just go by the numbers. So again, if you're given the equation, you should look at it. It happened to agree in this case. If you did the other way, it will not always agree. So again, if you're given the equation, you got to look at it, see what's going on, what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. If you're not given the equation, like our previous examples, you could simply get straight go by which one's more positive uh, would be your cathode. So it's an important thing to make sure you do. Uh, in this case, I could calculate my E of the cell. And once again, I'm going to subtract, so I'm not going to worry about the sign. So I'm going to take my cathode minus my anode. And once again, I'm going to leave the sign the way I find it. And that is going to give me basically 0.34 uh, minus a minus 0.44 gives us a 0 0.78 volts. In this case, we actually do have the same number of electrons in each, so that should be our n value, which would be two in this case. Again, not four, but two. And Faraday's constant there is a constant, so we pretty much have everything we need. Delta G would equal minus two moles of electrons, 96,500, which is a constant and our E of our cell, which is 0.78 volts. The volts will cancel, the moles will cancel. This is gonna leave us in joules when it's all said and done. And that will give us a two times 96.5 times a 0.78 and it is negative. And it helps, I guess, if I put the whole number in there, I'm gonna try that again, uh, 0.78, there you go. That's gonna give us a negative 150540 joules. And as we talked about in the thermodynamics chapter, usually delta G is like a kilojoule situation. So I'll just convert it to kilojoules and keep my negative there. First off, any question on the calculation? Converted it to kilojoules by dividing by a thousand, right? Reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Reaction is spontaneous. Yeah, that's how it is spontaneous. We have a negative delta G. And frankly, we could have made the determination it was spontaneous way back here because we got a positive delta E of the cell. So that would definitely give you a, a spontaneous reaction. Any questions on that one there? Yeah. Take a look at one here. Uh, will one molar nitric acid dissolve gold to form one molar gold three ions. Those are the SRP values that you would find there. So see what you come up with here. Um, so we'll start with uh, the cathode in this case is. Is it the gold? All right, so uh, that would be incorrect in this case. So let's talk about why that is. Uh, the question says, will nitric acid, which is this guy, Dissolve gold metal, which is this guy, to form gold with a plus three. That means this guy is on the wrong side, right? So actually, this is the one that needs to be reversed because of how the question is being asked, which means if we have to reverse that SRP one there, that means that then becomes our anode. And this guy is actually our cathode, as that is nitric acid right there on the correct side of the arrow. So again, it's really important to look at the equation that's given to you or even in words if it's given to you so that you do the correct one. Now that we got that hopefully arranged correctly, uh, we could calculate our E of our cell, which would be E of the cathode minus E of the anode. And in this case, our cathode being 0 0.96 volts. I'm not gonna change any sign because I'm subtracting. 
And that's going to give us uh, 0.96 minus a neg uh, positive 1.5. Going to give us negative 0 0.54 volts, which right at this point, I could make the determination, will it dissolve the metal? It will not because I have a negative E, which I know if I put into my delta G minus NF E minus three moles times 96,500, which is Faraday's constant, and my negative 0.54 volts. Negative here, negative here, going to turn my delta G into a positive number, which also means it's going to be non-spontaneous. So the answer is no, it will not work in this case. That is all right. <laughs> we will lay it up there for today.